take four. So, um, Tammy is involved in uh, some of the concerns about uh, veterans who have come home a lot with limbs are going through psychological uh, uh, difficulties, everything. Um, and one of the uh, places we hope this project can make a difference are when people who are facing struggles of any kind So I want to talk a little bit, if you can, about each of you went through your own personal dark night of the soul. And in that darkness, you found this ember that you blew into the flame of who you are today. And we may or may not be able to help another person on that journey, but if we can, lead them guideposts. And I think one of the guideposts is the tap code. What the tap code represents and you talked about it in your return to Vietnam and realizing that you had shared your pain. You had reached out, you had not isolated yourself. You had been isolated by the Vietnamese, but you didn't isolate yourself. And I think that's a key difference, that if we can share with others, if we can reach out to this amazing resource that the world is around us, we don't assume that people will be there to help, that they are. So if you could speak to that a little bit, I think that's Yep. Well, um, let me just see if I can put it in in, uh, in the right perspective for myself, so I can explain. Um, uh, years ago, I was at the, I had a political position. I was at the VA in the early 1980s. And following that, uh, the efforts uh, came to start to uh, tell the story about the, the Hanoi Hilton. So I had a, in the in 1991 time frame, I w had a, um, a producer, a fellow who wanted to do a documentary about the Hanoi Hilton reached out to me and, and wanted to me to go back to Vietnam to do a documentary uh, and film at the Hanoi Hilton because he wanted to get there before the Vietnamese government tore it down. The reason the Vietnamese government was going to tear down this big massive prison uh, complex was because of what happened there during the Vietnam War with the prisoners of war, and in essence, it was a black eye in the reputation of the Vietnamese government and world public opinion. So this fellow wanted me to go back, and I said, no way, if I'm gonna go anywhere for a week, uh, and I was busy at the time starting my business, raising my family, kids were still small, I was going to take my family on a vacation. I hadn't had a vacation for a while. Uh, I was finishing law school. I had finished law school. And I was really getting going in life, and I wasn't going to go back to Vietnam at all. I had no desire to get back there. Uh, and so he kept coming back and kept coming back, and finally my curiosity got the back of me, and I, so I, I agreed to go with him. And he was going to take six of the POWs uh, with him on this trip to Vietnam. And, and as I was getting ready to go, uh, I had other f people who said, you know, you're going to have all kinds of uh, emotional reactions up and down. You better take, they better take a nurse or a doctor with you uh, because you don't, you're going to have, it's going to be such a, um, an emotional roller coaster. You're going to have problems. And, you know, Vietnam veterans are having problems. Uh, post-traumatic stress and all that. I had not, and I was fortunate, and others who were POWs really were per quite normal in, in my view. So 
I got a little concerned about about that, and so I asked. I I, I gave my friend John McCain a call. He was at the, up on Capitol Hill, you, and I said uh, I said I said, Hey, John, you had just uh, been to Vietnam with uh, Walter Cronkite, and you did a trip. He says, Yeah, yeah, it was. I says, well, I'm I going to be going. To, told him about the documentary the guy wants to do. He says, oh, great. He, I said, but did you have any problems when you were there? Oh, Ev, don't pay attention to that BS. And he says, look, just go have a good time. And he started telling me about the, what, what restaurant to go eat, what hotel to stay in, what bars, and you could get a good massage at a couple of these bars, et cetera. And look, Go, go to the lake there, they have a statue of me, which is downtown Hanoi, which is the Lake of the Restored Sword. And so, so I was still apprehensive, but I, I went. And uh, playing with the six of us and the producer and uh, a couple of other individuals landed and uh, finally landed at, uh, after going through Thailand and the plane finally landed at uh, airport in Vietnam and I figured you know propaganda stuff here's going to be people Vietnamese girls with flowers and people with banners and headlines would be Alvarez comes back a man of peace rather than a man of war and I can imagine all kinds of stuff reality is there was nobody there we landed and the ramp was barren not a soul around, so in, a, in one way you could say there was a disappointment, but uh, it was good, there, they, there was nobody there. So we had to go pick up our own luggage. And, uh, there was a truck that was uh, hired, a local group, a uh, couple of people for logistics support. Took us into town and uh, Hanoi had not changed uh, since 73. There was a, a million people in the city with uh, riding a bicycle, no cars, peasant garb, conical straw hats, all over the place. Just the only difference being that uh, in every little hovel I could see had a little Sony TV and they were all watching West American Western, uh, you know, Western TV, whatever, whatever the programs were. Uh, so. We, we went into our hotel, et cetera. Finally, we went to the Hanoi Hilton on a Sunday. They had to move the prisoners because it was still occupied. It was still a big prison for Vietnamese. And, and they showed us, you know, they filmed where I lived and all these. And the camera's that far away, and it's ready to record all of the, whatever I was supposed to feel, whatever I was supposed to show. Uh, and I'm, I go into the room where I used to live uh, we go into other cells that where they used to put a, have us in manacles, uh, the torture rooms, uh, uh, a place we call Heartbreak Hotel, a little section of the Hanoi Hilton. And the camera's showing all this, and I'm, you know, this thing is right up there to show tears, maybe, or to show uh, an emotional reaction to seeing but there was nothing, and, and nothing. And so they finally stopped filming me and uh, they were taking a break. And so I went out and I sat in the courtyard, which is a small courtyard, which was inside the main gate. And out that gate was the outside, the exit. We had gathered in this small courtyard uh, back in 1973 to finally go through that gate and to board the buses that took us to the airport to freedom. And I'm sitting here while the crew is doing something else, what have you, and I'm wondering why, and I remember thinking to myself, what's wrong with me? You know, I was no reaction, no blah, I mean it was blah. I mean, I was a failure. I, I didn't react like I was supposed to react. And I'm thinking about it, and then it hit me. 
When I had been at the VA, one of the things that we did in the early 1980s is we put together uh, this program to establish these uh, walk-in centers in the communities that were for Vietnam veterans come back, they were having trouble, and the, Viet the Vietnam veterans didn't trust the VA, the hospitals, so we established these storefront centers where you could walk in. Th these centers were managed by Vietnam veteran counselors who were, had been trained, and, good, and, and this was a place where they could come and they could deal with their issues, their problems, and they, even the families would come in, and it was a very successful program. And one of the big programs that one of the big things that these programs did, did was that there was a place where the Vietnam veterans could communicate and talk to other veterans about their experience. They couldn't talk about it to their families. They couldn't talk about it sometimes to their wives. And certainly the VA, which at that time was run by World War II bureaucrats, really didn't understand what these guys were going through with regard to, quote, post post-traumatic stress, PTSD. So, and it was a, a successful, and one of the things that they used to do was sit around and they would have rap sessions. They would talk and unload what happened and how they felt about things, and it hit me. Those same, uh, the same practical things is something that we did as POWs, that when, no matter what happened, we would get on the wall and we would tap, and we would tap what we were going through, and what we had gone through. We'd go to interrogation. Here's what they did. Here's what they wanted to know. When we went out and were tortured for propaganda, or they were punished for this, and we'd be out there gone for days and days and come back, right away you let everybody know. And, and, and so we kept each other's spirits up. When we did something that we were felt dejected about, we, were, uh, we felt, uh, I mean, we just, when we broke, when we had to, you know, do things that we totally, totally personally ashamed of, we helped each other, we lifted each other up, we tapped through that wall, and it was that tapping that was our form of unloading, it was a rap session, we, we unloaded everything, we didn't keep any secrets, we shared everything and and it was something that we all did because we all broke we all went through the same experiences 95 percent of us did and and that's when i realized that when we left that prison and we walked out that those gates to get on the bus to come home we left the garbage behind us and that's why i have to, to credit that that's why we a lot of us that went on with their lives, it was sort of like Bob Shoemaker would tell people, we all broke, get over it, let's go on. We did, we, we, got, we got over it and we went on and uh, there was no, no burden on our shoulders, there was no guilt, it was all left there. And I think that was the most important, another important factor for, uh, who we are today, uh, that experience. If, if you could, um, Ev, just think of those uh, young men and women struggling today. Just say directly to the camera, courage, if you would, people struggling today with questions they can't answer, to whatever it means to get on the wall, to share their stories with others who can understand that, that it will help them. Yeah. You know this. Well, my experience, our experience, has shown that, uh, you know, having the ability to, to, to talk to others, to share that experience, uh, especially someone who's undergone uh, similar uh, uh, hardships, similar experiences uh, or compassionate people who, even though they may not have experienced what you have experienced, w are willing to listen to you. If you just talk about it, 
unload it and, and, and get it out there. And really, I found that it, it helps us uh, when you have tough decisions to make in the future, you know. Talk about those, those emotions and those feelings and the hardship and how hard it is to deal with these things so that, you know, sometimes two, three minds are much better than one and coming to a resolution and solving these things. And even if you're by yourself and you're the leader in leadership and you have to make these decisions, and the, and the mere fact that if you can share that experience with others so you don't, you know, and, you, and you've honestly gone through and you can say to yourself, with all honesty, I'm really, you know, give, doing the best I can, given and considering everything. I think that uh, that you'll go a long ways in uh, feeling better about yourself. And hey, we're not all perfect. We all make mistakes. We're humans, and we're going to make mistakes. But. Uh, sharing that is and talking about it goes a long ways thank you sir that was tremendous uh, let's quickly bring in the board we have this head uh I, yeah let's cut for a moment so ev all is just think of a message you'd like to pass uh it could be 